Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Katie Wolfgang. I am uh, the Director of Workforce Policy and Strategy for the City of Philadelphia's Department of Commerce. And on behalf of a really, uh, I think, an outstanding panel, we want to welcome you to today's session on workforce development, increasing access and equity. I'm going to share with you who is here um, just by name and title, but you'll hear from everybody one by one at the upfront uh, of this discussion. And we really look forward to, we're a very chatty group, but what we most want to do is be uh, in dialogue with all of you. So we encourage you to, to think of questions and engage us as we get to the second part of today's panel. Um, I'm very lucky to be joined today by Shirley Moy, Executive Director of the LenFest North Philadelphia Workforce Initiative at Temple University, uh, by Tyrone Hampton Jr., Manager of Workforce System Initiatives at Philadelphia Works, uh, by Zakia Ali, MLD, SHRM SCP, Director of Workforce Initiatives, and my colleague at the City of uh, Philadelphia Department of Commerce, uh, and by Don Thomas, Communications and Outreach Manager at Philadelphia Works, and special credit to Don for putting together this terrific panel. And we hope at some point soon to be joined by Ramona Briscoe, uh, Risco Benson, Director of Corporate and Community Relationships uh, for PICO. And so, um, I want to uh, I want to say that together. I hope that we, over the next uh, 45, 55 minutes, can spark an important dialogue around the incredible imperative before us. How do we, as a community of workforce development professionals, engage each other and the residents we are responsible to serve in solving the unprecedented challenges that have come with the impact of COVID-19? And we recognize that while those uh, challenges have been magnified by all that's happening around us, they're rooted in um, longstanding racial inequality, by siloed approaches to problem solving, and by what we all talk about a lot these days, the all too frequent disconnect between workforce professionals and the communities that we really are aiming to serve. And so I'm just gonna get started uh, with some questions again to my colleagues. I'll start with you, Shirley. Um, you know, we're not gonna get this solved in an hour, um, but we, in order to increase access and equity in our public workforce system, uh, I think it helps us to focus and to identify the priority areas where um, we think we can see results uh, and the most productive and progressive outcomes. And I know that you're doing that work um, with the LenFest North Philadelphia Workforce Initiative. Can you talk about some of these priorities you've identified, the kinds of solutions you think are possible, and um, where, where you see yourself as getting started in this work? Okay, well, thank you, Katie, for your introductory remarks. I appreciate every the opportunity to share, and I also look forward to hearing from my colleagues and from the audience, too, as well. So if I want to repeat the question is, like, what priorities has the LenFest North Philadelphia Workforce Initiative set, and are those priorities achievable? Um, and since we have a number of experts on the panel, I'm going to focus my answer on access and equity on some of the priority populations where I do think we can do more with. Um, while I'm going to focus on people with a disability as an example, there are obviously other populations that experience similar challenges related to access and equity. So I want to first explain that the LenFest North Philadelphia Workforce Initiative defines North Philadelphia as the eight zip codes surrounding Temple University's main campus and the hospital. And according to data provided by Philadelphia Works and the Economy League of Greater Philadelphia, one in five adults one in five adults in North Philadelphia have disability. Um, and in the unemployed labor force in North Philadelphia, 14% of the unemployed people have a disability. And of the folks that are employed in North Philadelphia, they, uh, people with a disability only make up 6% of the folks that are employed. And if you look at the, uh, the Pennsylvania career link system, 3% of the users in North Philadelphia self-report that they have a disability. So you can see from the data that there's a large, there's a significant percentage of people with a disability. Um, a number of them are in the workforce, less percentage are employed, and there's even a lesser percentage that self-report that they have a disability. So the data kind of poses more questions about who uses their career link system and whether people with a disability feel comfortable with disclosing their, that they have a disability or uncomfortable or, or whether they don't feel that it's a need to disclose it. There's a question of whether those that are not participating in the public workforce system are by choice not participating because one, they don't think that the system is um, a, a, can serve them in the best way. Um, or there's a question of whether the, the system um, can be better designed so that we can support folks with a disability. 
while access is one part of the equation, there's also the part of the equation that is, is there equity for folks with a disability who do want to work? And so by equity, equity, I'm talking about, do they receive the appropriate quality services um, equal to others? And so, um, so that they can meet their needs. So oftentimes, for instance, people with a disability um, have the opportunity to participate in very low level and not necessarily as, as meaningful work as other folks. Sometimes um, it's referred to as they're given the opportunity to do the five Fs, working in food, flowers, folding, filing, or working in filth. And so those aren't necessarily as meaningful as other opportunities that we can afford them and think about. So as service providers, and I think even as employers like Temple University being a huge employer, I think the issue of access and equity challenges us to think about how we design programs from the onset, at the conception of the program, and even during the implementation of the program, taking into consideration these populations like people with a disability. And I can substitute out people with a disability with other populations. Are we providing those kinds of programmatic designs and inclusion for people who are um, English language learners or who are immigrants or people with low level literacy or have digital literacy challenges or people who are returning citizens. So I know we wanted to keep our remarks kind of brief because we have a number of um, present presenters too. So in closing, I just want to say that I think the priorities are achievable, absolutely. Um, but we can be better informed, better prepared, better equipped and proactive to plan and provide a service program or system that is accessible and equitable before these folks show up at our doorstep so that we are very meaningfully planning a system that works for everybody. So thanks, Katie, for the opportunity to share. Great, thanks, Shirley. Um, I think something that sort of is a part of what you're talking about and what I hope, I think and expect to hear from, that we'll hear from everybody today is this concept of like working together and partnership. And um, I think we understand that the folks on this call and I imagine the folks in the audience that businesses and employers are really vital partners in this work and to the overall economic strength and well-being of our city. And so Philadelphia really has some tremendously um, exemplary employers already engaged in this work long before the pandemic and have really leaned in. And so Tyrone, I, was, I wanted to turn to you to see if you could share with us what you see in the work that you do at Philadelphia Works. What are the things that make for a good workforce partner? And what are some ways that local businesses and employers are engaging in the workforce system to both drive access to and uh, access to meaningful careers and success once people get into those positions? Sure, thank you, Katie. Uh, first, I want to start off with talking about uh, some of the relationships we already have built within uh, our workforce system. So I'll start with our Pay for Success partnership that we have with, Com with Com uh, Comcast. So in a nutshell, Pay for Success is essentially a social impact bond, which is really innovative, uh, innovative funding model. So we forged this relationship and partnership with Comcast over the last year and a half to really create opportunities and access for job seekers uh, to gain uh, employment at Comcast within their sales positions. So although we've had to pause several times due to COVID and all the things that came with that, we are hopeful that we're able to launch this project within uh, early next year. But one of the things I want to highlight is it's important for engagement and workforce development for a, a company such as Comcast, but because I think it gives people an opportunity, other agencies, other philanthropic agencies as well, to see Comcast and say, wow, we can do this as well. Because sometimes you just need an example to lead the way. So I think Comcast has been a great partner in that aspect of being for people being able to visualize how to engage in workforce uh, development. Also, uh, briefly, I want to talk about the Rebuild Philadelphia, which is another City of Philadelphia initiative that Philadelphia Works is a partner on, where we're providing a career pathways for job seekers to gain access to the trades unions. So there's a lot of momentum there, a lot of access and equity as well. And I want to think about, want everyone to think about um, the importance of why we engage in workforce development. Like the goal and foundation of what we do is to essentially provide access and opportunities to job seekers, right? Like the goal is not for 
just to have a lot of meetings and a lot of initiative, but to be able to really provide opportunities and sustainable living wages for our job seekers. So I think one of the things that makes a good workforce partner is a workforce partner that is willing to take the time to understand um, our system because in true uh, full transparency, you know, workforce development is not an easy system to navigate or understand. So it takes a workforce uh, partner that really takes the time to understand our system and really figure out and be intentional around why they're partnering with uh, workforce development. Because I think once people begin to engage in workforce development in a different kind of way, they'll be able to see the return on investment with their engagement. So one of the things I also want to make clear is that we're not uh, we don't want employers to engage in workforce development just to provide access, but also access coupled with opportunities. Because the goal and foundation of all of this work is for people to become employed, for people to have better training opportunities. So uh, in my closing, I would say uh, I would encourage everyone that is willing and able to engage in workforce development, engage as much as you can, get it, take the time to learn what we do to be able to better provide uh, opportunities for our job seekers in Philadelphia. Thank you, Katie. Thanks so much, Tyrone. And I think you you have the perfect, um, you've offered the perfect lead in to, um, to, for Ramona, who was able to join us. We're so happy to have you here because we're talking about employers and employers who are leading the way and our champions. And um, that is exactly, I think, how all of us on this panel and many others would describe Kiko. Can you share a little bit about why workforce development has always been so important to you and how you're leading the role in this field and being sort of examples and role models to your fellow employers around the region and especially how some of that work may be you might be thinking about it differently or approaching it differently during this time. Thank you, Katie. I am really happy to be with uh, you and everyone here today. Increasing access and equity is an important part of our focus and conversation at PICO. In fact, we have been in this space for over 50 years. We are a founding partner of the Philadelphia Academy's program uh, and also a founding partner of Urban Affairs Coalition and in particular supporting the equity and contracts for supplies and services, as well as development of smaller nonprofit organizations uh, that the organization supports. About 15 years ago, we started the People Energizing Education Program. It's a STEM program to introduce students to careers in energy, approaches to, to community energy savings, and becoming students. And part of this was to start developing uh, uh, and a more of an understanding of this industry, the potential opportunities, so that some of the young people coming out of school uh, would think about PICO or other companies that support uh, the energy sector uh, as they uh, started to look at career development. Over 10 years ago, our talent management team began offering a community partners day to introduce organizations to employment opportunities at PICO. This included a train the trainer class for the CAST test, one of the required exams for those interested in many of the craft trade positions we offer. While we saw some results with our partners, we realized that a more comprehensive approach would make greater results for potential employment opportunities in the energy sector and with PICO. We also wanted to be able to provide access to more of the jobs that we know provide family sustaining wages. Our strategy involves a consortium of community colleges in our region in the development of a gas line mechanics program. We've been offering this one for about five years, and we knew that our planned capital investment replacing gas line infrastructure would require additional workers for this sector. Also partnering with organizations like the Philadelphia OIC and Philadelphia Energy Authority and the School District of Philadelphia supporting two programs designed to introduce smart energy career opportunities, primarily solar installation and energy efficiency auditing. These are two business growth areas in our sector. OIC trains adults from underrepresented communities who are unemployed or underemployed, and the PEA school district program holds that training into a two-year school-based model 
Both programs also include CAS test preparation, OSHA training, and certification. Our efforts to focus on workforce issues in this way became more comprehensive because we, we realized we had to create the circumstances for more people to be introduced to the energy sector and for interested adults to know more about our job requirements. For this work, our industry hires individuals with high school diplomas or the equivalents. These jobs are considered family sustaining and provide the opportunity for careers that we say with all boats. Families can live comfortably, provide opportunities, and support aspirations of their children. We know that these jobs are, in fact, transformational. Our CEO led an initiative to look at ways in which we could make improvements to what and how we provide access. We had a team that specifically focused on barriers to entry and retention. Finally, we also know that the need is great in our city and region. We won't move the needle without working and partnering with other companies and businesses who also have hiring needs. So our access to more jobs at Pugo, partnership with others, with others, is now being done in a more concerted way with our recently formed workforce development team led by Sabrina Brooks. This team is charged with working to support the programs we have in place, develop new infrastructure models for candidate preparation, and work with others to prepare and pool talent. PICO is a leading employer in the region. We should be at the table working with others to create employment opportunities. So thank you so much for having me uh, be a part of this discussion. Great, thanks so much, Ramona. It's really, um, it's really inspiring to hear like all the specific examples that you're able to share and all of the details. And I think it, it makes me understand that um, there's a real need for us to be able to share information like what you have just shared with residents who could take most advantage of it. And that's um, sometimes tricky to do, especially in this day and age. And so I want to turn um, to Don. Uh, you are leading communications for Philadelphia Works, and we know, um, and if you didn't already, you know after hearing all this that, that there's a lot to it. It's complex and it's confusing, um, but you've really helped to bring people together to align messaging and to really be thoughtful about how do we take a bunch of jargon and a bunch of disparate, really um, important things and bring it together and get that information out um, through a robust outreach strategy. And so I'd love to talk to you. I'd love for you just to share a little bit about um, how you're doing that and what impact you think you're having and that you'd like to have moving forward. Sure. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Katie? Great. So um, welcome, everyone. I want to thank you all. Um, first of all, just to thank this amazing panel for saying, for trusting me and saying yes to this workforce newbie. I'm actually pretty new to workforce. So when I reached out to Zykea and Katie and Shirley and Tyrone and Ramona, and they said, sure, Dawn, we'll, you know, we'll hop on this crazy train with you. I was like, yes. So collaboration. So I'm going to start with a little math um, equation quote I like to remember, and it's that collaboration divides the work, but multiplies the success. Mm -hmm. And in a city as diverse and as, um, as Philadelphia, with an equally large and complex public workforce system, we know how difficult and sometimes frustrating it can be uh, for residents uh, to navigate the public workforce resources that are set in place and readily available for them to learn, earn, and grow um, in our city. And it's vital that every single workforce agency be intentional about working better together to make those public resources more accessible for those who we are seeking to serve. Um, recently, Philadelphia Works, uh, the city of Philadelphia, uh, Katie uh, sort of spearheaded this, and the Philadelphia Youth Network partnered to create a summer workforce resource guide that created easy access points for career seekers, youth and young adults alike, um, to take advantage of the summer months to strengthen their skills, to find employment, um, to explore careers and to vol and or to volunteer. All of these things are great um, workforce activities that prepare individuals to land on uh, meaningful career pathways. Uh, you know, I counted in that initiative that uh, that collaboration brought together 16 stakeholders from seven different organizations and was accomplished in less than two months, had a potential reach of about 855,000 people 
that is more reach than any one organization can do on its own. Um, and, and by the way, you can find that, that resource guide in the resource, uh, the participant resource uh, tab on, on your screen. So that was a really, really good example of how we came together to make really big impact and to bring together the services that we offer and create and uncomplicate access points for those services. Um, then we can't have collaboration without proper representation. When we set out to serve as a public workforce system, our work truly needs to mirror the, the diverse city we serve. How many times have we sat through a fair wages panel without an employer's voice? Or how many times have we, you know, ha set up a forum to help vulnerable communities outside of set community? Without inclusive and intentional representation, we assume, we project, and we fail to include the voices of those that matter the most. I hope, um, I hope that we have uh, a job seeker in the audience that is here and is asking, and, and, and who's going to ask questions because it's not missed upon me that we don't have a career seeker on this panel yet. We're here, you know, having this amazing discussion around what career seekers need and what the workforce system can offer them. Uh, finally, I want to talk about networking, or as I like to call it, self-advocacy. Um, as both a career seeker and as a professional in the public workforce space, um, while I've been in comms for over a decade, I'm very new to workforce, as I said before. As a workforce professional, I was shocked to learn that I've always played a role and been part of workforce in some way, um, some way, shape, or form in my lifetime. And I was a young single mother on public assistance without a diploma and barely keeping a roof over my head. I was among what we in, what, what we in workforce consider to be vulnerable um, and an opportunity youth, right? I was disengaged from high school. I hadn't graduated. So, you know, in workforce, we, we, we put, you know, we call that opportunity youth and vulnerable. Then when I was finally employed, working and making about $14,000 a year, I was considered underemployed, right? I was barely making it. Um, and then before I attended college, um, I, I was, um, I got a better job, but then I got, I needed to be upskilled, right? So I was kind of like, I needed some more skills to grow. And then when I graduated from college and was laid off, laid off because of the 2008 recession, I was considered a dislocated worker, right? Then I ran my own consulting firm and I was considered an entrepreneur and a big worker and a contractor and sometimes an employer. And it would have been nice to know that all along there was this public workforce system around me that could have been offering me resources at every point in my life, at every point in my career. Um, and, and I didn't know that, right? But now that I'm in workforce, I do know that. So no matter who you are, if you, are a, if you live or do business in Philadelphia, you are part of the economy and the public workforce system, you are counted and you count, you belong here and, um, and have either something to gain or offer our great city. So please find your voice and find a place in this space and connect with us because we're waiting for you. Thank you, Katie. Thanks, John. I have two quick messages before I turn to our last uh, our last panelist. So if you haven't already, we encourage you to start putting your questions in the chat so they can be curated and sent back to us. Uh, we look forward to transitioning to that part. And then Dawn also referenced, but I want to really encourage people, there's resources that are available to you if you're in the audience that sort of, if any of the things that you've heard today about today you want to know more about, you can link through to those and get the details. Uh, um, and get the details from there. So uh, I am going to uh, turn to Zakia to, to talk about a very specific sort of access barrier that has always really, frankly, been around, but has like, uh, risen to the spotlight uh, in recent days. And that is the, the issue of digital access. And so the city, uh, the city of Philadelphia has rallied both with internally and with our partners at Comcast and the school district and philanthropy to, to begin to chip away at this issue of digital access with a very intense focus over the summer on making sure that uh, K households that have students going to school all the way up through the end of high school um, can access free, reliable internet and in at the levels that they need so that their, their children and their households can participate actively in school. And so we, the city announced and launched in partnership with all those entities I mentioned, uh, something called PHL Connected. We learned a lot from, um, from the folks in Chicago about how to put it together, but now any, um, 
anyone without internet can uh, call 211 and get figure out how to get um, connected. Um, but early on in the implementation, one of the things we're really realizing, which I think goes back to the, to the theme of what we're talking about today, is that um, just having that resource is not enough. But figuring out how to communicate that resource is, is equally important. And working with people in communities to be the communicators um, to help in spreading the net message to dispel fears or rumors or uncertainties to help people access and underst understand, qualify, quantify their needs, and then access and advocate for themselves. And so we're really thinking about how to apply those lessons learned to uh, PHL Connected. But we also know that K-12 households is just a sliver of, of the larger um, community of residents we have. And so with that, we need to understand and solve for our larger access issues. And so I want to turn to Zakia, to, 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 if you can share with us what some of what you think are some areas of misconception and opportunities when it comes to access and equity that career seekers and employers face when it comes to digital technology and use. Great, thank you, Katie. So, uh, you know, technology has completely transformed the way we communicate, learn, do business, work, and engage civically. And as we become more reliant on computers and the internet to search for jobs and manage so many aspects of daily life, it's important that we ensure that residents who do not have access to this vital technology get access. And so one of the biggest misconceptions about the digital divide is that because someone has a mobile phone, then they have sufficient technology connection or are digitally proficient. And so data and experience expose this as a myth, a really big myth. While mobile phones are certainly great for making phone calls, texting and tweeting and getting on Instagram, um, they are not ideal for customizing a resume or for submitting an online job application, right? Another misconception is that all individuals without computer or internet access are lacking this technology and connectivity because they are poor. Now, true, many families cannot afford the cost of buying or maintaining a computer, and others face challenges with navigating what can be really confusing broadband packages or even figuring out a plan that works for their budget. Now, while uh, many families and individuals may be in a lower socioeconomic stratum, we should not view the population of individuals that lack a computer and internet access as a monolith. Instead, it's incumbent upon us to really conduct research and allow data to drive the assessment of the various underlying reasons for the digital divide. Often our solutions focus and center solely on those that are poor or in poverty. And we wind up overlooking the subpopulation of families and individuals that actually have the means to purchase a computer and internet access, and just for various reasons have not done so. And so too often, many people have actually learned how to get by in life without using a computer and the internet. And as a result, they are often unaware of the many life-changing opportunities that are available online. So in my experience, these individuals would benefit greatly from receiving information about reasonably priced computers, low-cost broadband access, budgeting and money management, and from being encouraged to assess or rather reassess their value systems in order to make better financial decisions for themselves and their families, decisions that can center on investing in, in a computer and actually getting internet access. And so in terms of areas for opportunity, you know, as a human resources professional, I view the use of online job application systems, also known as applicant tracking systems, to be a key driver of employment and equity, and as a result, economic inequity. And so the majority of these applicant tracking systems are designed to sort through hundreds of job applications and resumes and really select those that have keywords that match the job posting. This entire process serves as a disadvantage to job seekers that one, may not know how this applicant tracking system works and two, that do not have good, excellent writing skills. So while applicant tracking systems make work tasks easier for HR professionals, it has really caused talented individuals to be overlooked for good and great jobs. So in short, if you do not have a computer 
internet access, a basic understanding of how applicant tracking systems work, and good writing ability, then the likelihood that you will be able to compete for and attain well-paying jobs with good benefits is diminished. And so the field of human resources, specifically recruitment and talent acquisition, while they have leveraged technology to increase efficiency, the unfortunate consequence is that it has also produced significant inequities in hiring and employment, which have disproportionately impacted job seekers of color and those on the lower socioeconomic strata. Thanks, Akia. Um, and thanks to everybody for your opening remarks. I'm going to turn. I'm starting to get questions in from the chat, which I really appreciate. And uh, for each of them, we'll probably hear from a couple panelists and keep it moving. So we're going to start with um, a question from Monique. And Monique is interested in knowing what panel like, across the panel, anyone who wants to, to jump in to start, um, what do you see as the barriers to collaboration and data sharing and tracking um, in the work that you're trying to do? And how, how have, you, have you been addressing those barriers? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I'm, I'm going to take that one on because, you know, collaboration happens for a, a few reasons. One is because you don't have the capacity to do it on your own, right? So there are capacity issues there. Um, that's one thing. The second reason collaboration happens is because there are multiple audiences that you're trying to reach. And, you know, you may not have access to those audiences or you may not, you may not be engaged with those audiences as much as you want. So the capacity issue creeps back in during collaboration when it's time to uh, track outcomes from the effort that was put in. So, you know, Katie and I, again, worked together on the Summer Workforce Resource Fly. One of the, what, one of the questions we asked in the beginning was how do we know that this resource got into the hands that we intended it to get into? And how do we know you know, who was helped from this effort. And unfortunately, it is a barrier to go back to those 16 stakeholders, those seven organizations and say, hey, you know, what was the outcome from this effort? And it's something that we need to get better at and be more intentional about on the front end so that we can re report those outcomes from our effort on um, on the back end. And, it, it, and one barrier is that there's so many stakeholders, the other barrier is that there are, you know, there are 1.5 million people in Philadelphia, right? And then you have the workforce professionals who are trying to, um, we really are a, a public workforce system. So we help, we're here to help everyone. Um, so once something is sort of completed, we have to do a better job of going back and saying, what was the impact? What were the outcomes? And did we accomplish what we set out to accomplish? So we'll be looking more into that as we um, seek larger collaborations in our workforce system. So thank you, Victoria, for that question. Great. And Shirley, I think you're working at it from a different vantage point. So I'd love to see if you had something to add. Yeah, so the LenFest North Philadelphia Workforce Initiative, supported by the LenFest Foundation, allows us to create partnerships with 20 different organizations, both within Temple and external to Temple. And so I would say um, I love what we're doing, but I didn't get there easily. So there are issues of competition for limited resources and breaking down feelings of uh, building trust. I wouldn't say it's distrust necessarily, but a matter of building trust with each other, knowing that we won't take advantage of people's um, relationships with employers or um, we are able to share common clients that can benefit from both our services and not just keep that person to ourselves um, or keep that connection to employers or connections to other services to ourselves that we can look at the greater good and say, yeah, okay, I, you know, I don't need this employer connection. I'm going to share it with Philadelphia Housing Authority. And so being able to build that trust, having the greater good in mind um, is a, um, would serve us better in terms of collaboration. And then common language around outcomes and outputs and understanding that, you know, maybe the ultimate goal is employment, but we can appreciate all the other kind of outcomes that gets people to employment. And so that kind of appreciation, understanding of the system and, um, you know, seeing the value of all the partners together would help in collaboration. Great. Thanks. Um, 
Uh, we have a question from Jordy, and my apologies for what I'm sure was a mispronunciation of your name, but uh, the big question I think a lot of us are asking these days uh, is what career paths are recommended for Philadelphians without a bachelor's degree? Um, and I would also just add in there for, for Philadelphians who don't yet have a high school credential, what are the starting salaries and opportunities for growth in these career pathways? Um, does anybody want to take a first stab? I have some thoughts, but happy to jump in myself. You can start, Katie. <laughs> Great. Um, so I think that um, rather than offering a very specific answer on this is the job or that is the job, I think the first thing that we would all recommend is to connect that person to the PA Creeling system that behind Tyrone and Ton, there's just a really like an amazing group of people that can help somebody think through that. And then I think the second thing that all of us as workforce professionals and just you know, whether we're mentors or teachers or parents or guides, um, is that now more than ever, this whole idea of lifelong learning is so important. And so I was saying to somebody yesterday that, you know, I remember when I finished college, this like moment where everybody is asking, like, what are you doing next? As if the answer to that question is your life, is the answer to your life, the, the, your future. But really it's like, what are you doing next in the next month or the next six months or the next year? And so I think, if people can get to the PA Curling system or get to somebody in their lives who has a career that they're excited or inspired by, it's really about helping people think about, if my end goal is here, what is the first step I need to take? And that nobody is going from where they are to their ultimate career overnight. And um, there's a lot of resources available to people to build the skills and education and to earn and learn, whether it's through apprenticeship, PA, uh, Philadelphia Works has an amazing initiative called Apprenticeship PHL, so people can learn about opportunities exactly as, as I mentioned to like start working and earning and learning all at the same time. Um, Zakia, do you want to add to that? Absolutely. And I think there it's twofold. I know that it's um, really interesting to find out what are those career pathways and traje trajectories for someone to, you know, really launch and build a successful career. And that continues to change in light of COVID as many businesses are recovering um, from, from the shutdown related to uh, COVID-19. But what I will say is one of the areas that I encourage many of our program participants in is to seek a career path and track in management and in a supervisory realm, because often those positions do not always require a bachelor's degree. Many of them start out as team leader or frontline supervisor positions and are really predicated on the skills that someone brings to the table customer service, interpersonal, and basic leadership um, and supervisory skills. And so oftentimes supervisors can make upwards of 60 and $70,000 and never have a, a bachelor's degree at all. So it's about the skills you develop and how you lead other people. So I would say exploring a career path and track along um, supervisory levels and, and management would be an excellent start as well, regardless of industry. Great, and I'm gonna stick with you as the uh... As a resident HR professional on this call, we got uh, on our panel. So we got a um, a question here from Ben, who says, uh, "Sorry, he says um, too often recruiters in HR have no knowledge of U.S. immigration law and imagine that every immigrant needs sponsorship or special visa, and which is not the case for most immigrants. How can we increase our efforts to educate employers about uh, about these barriers?" And I'm going to take an extra liberty and ask you to talk for a minute about the Fair Chance Hiring Initiative, because I think that also speaks to trying to address employer mis uh, misconceptions. Absolutely. What a great question. So we do know that um, from time to time, HR professionals may not have all of the details around the very many employment laws that are out there. It is a lot to process and digest. And so um, related specifically to U.S. immigration, one of the things that we can do uh, is to leverage our really strong partnership and connection with the local chapter of the Society for Human Resource Management, which is called Philly Sherm for short. And so that's a network of local businesses and HR professionals that really engage in a lot of webinars and learning sessions um, on a monthly basis. They're offering many of those types of sessions. And so 
Uh, one of the topics could certainly be on the U.S. immigration laws, because you're absolutely right. Not every position requires a visa. And so that's one avenue where we have shared information with Billy Sherm to get out to their HR members to foster education. Uh, most recently, a lot of that uh, education has been around COVID and some of the um, uh, um, sick leave laws that have changed as a result of the coronavirus. And so we can certainly leverage that. Also sitting in the Commerce Department, we have a unique advantage of being connected to both small, mid-sized and really large organizations where we can share that information and influence that practice because we certainly do not want to limit opportunities of immigrants to build careers here uh, in Philadelphia and to be successful. So those are two main ways we can continue to kind of share specific uh, and relevant information with businesses and HR professionals so that one, they're not um, limiting their talent pool and that there's no undue or illegal discrimination occurring. And a quick plug for our Fair Chance Hiring Initiative. So the city of Philadelphia, in light of COVID-19, has recently revamped several aspects of our Fair Chance Hiring Initiative, which um, allows us to work with small and mid-sized businesses, primarily those that make less than $5 million in annual revenue, to support them in understanding how another population like immigrants, but the population of citizens returning from incarceration, also offer great experiences and have talents and skills to contribute. And so we want to not just encourage employers to hire from that population, but provide them with financial incentives to do so. Um, so it's another way that we're leveling the playing field and increasing access and opportunity for one of our more vulnerable populations, which are individuals that have already served their time in incarceration and are trying to rebuild their lives and careers by connecting to meaningful employment. Um, we've gotten some questions. We're hearing we're getting questions about how people can get in touch with us. And one thing I think I can say with great confidence is that this group is really, um, we're interested in working together and expanding our circle. So through the BPHL website, if you go to any of our bios, you'll be able to send emails to us directly. Um, we have a question here from Luke that says, uh, what do you think are the greatest biases that need to be addressed in the workforce system in order to better work towards equity? And I'm going to I'm gonna throw out an answer myself because I feel really strongly about this, but welcome what other people on the panel need to say. I think because so much of the public workforce uh, system is funded through uh, public dollars that define people in ways that they would never define themselves, low income, formerly incarcerated, young men. That, that tends to be perpetuated all the way out to employers. And so what I have found, um, having worked for many years on PowerCore PHL, which engages 18 to 26 year old young adults. And in the description of the program, they're young adults who've had barriers to employment and have many of them been recently incarcerated or come through the, the foster care system. And none of those things in working with those young adults are what you see if you spend two minutes with them. And, and I think for all of us to be really thinking about the language that we use with each other, with employers, I've, I find all of the work I've done with employers is is unless is really about this is the skill I'm looking for, this is the personality trait I'm looking for, and when we can match that and get rid of the labels, I think we can be much more um, successful. Uh, and it looks like Zakia, uh, you I can imagine working with you all the time that you have lots to add to that. Please do. Yep, and I'll make it quick in case any of our other panelists want to jump in. But I'll say, you know, in full transparency, and I've been in this field for quite some time, I think it is important for us to really acknowledge and call out what can be a bit of an ugly side of our uh, industry, and in that sometimes the individuals we serve and support. Um, do not receive the type of service and customer care and customer support that they should. And sometimes it's been far too easy for some of our frontline uh, staff that should be in a position to help and serve, look down on those individuals because they're either unemployed or a dislocated worker or returning from incarceration or English is not their first language or they may have a disability. And so that's an area where we have to be really intentional and make sure that we have staff that are service oriented, service focused, and do not look down on anyone. This is really rich and rewarding work to help individuals really get their footing in employment. And so that is an unfortunate portion of, of uh, the experience of some of our clients and job seekers that from a bias standpoint, I think we, we have to address and root out. And I would, 
also add, um, I totally agree. There is sometimes uh, been a stigma around access to anytime people are involved in the public workforce system. But I think we just need to do more work. More work is needed to uh, just change the narrative around that. And I think we've already started that with some of the work we've done with reimagining and redesigning our uh, service delivery model within the PA Career Link Center, where we're able to offer people individualized services versus something cookie cutter and robotic. PA are offering people individualized service delivery. I think, and that helps change the stigma around um, how we treat customers because all job seekers. Not wanting to treat it as individual. They've done a lot of work to get to that point, but obviously we um, change the narrative and workforce systems. Yeah, and Katie, I just want to add really quickly, I want to go back up to Monique's question around um, the, the opportunities available for people who do not have a bachelor's degree. Uh, there is so much information around workforce out here. And one of the things that Philadelphia Works publishes every year is our high priority occupations list. And this is a list that is, um, it, it, it combines a, a lot of workforce data and it sort of spews out what the high priority occupations are for the year, for the year to come. And this um, this list informs where resources go go into, where training resources go into, and that list is public. People can go in and see in the different counties what what occupations are really growing and where workforce investments are going to be um, in, in the coming year. So whether that is in healthcare or IT or it's in um, construction or manufacturing, um, th those and it changes every year based off of, of input from our workforce development boards and, and, and our partners, our educators, our training providers, that list changes every year. So go on there and see in your locale in Philadelphia, what the high priority occupa occupations are and explore those careers. And those can be easily found at philoworks.org under data and trends. Hi, this is uh, Ramona. Ramona. Sorry for uh, my uh, connectivity issues um, in this discussion. It's been really important and I'm happy to hear of the perspectives that have been shared. Um, I think it's important for people to keep the energy sector in mind. I think the idea of being able to consider um, a, a job and a career in the utility um, circle in particular, talking about people, but also our sister companies that are in the area, like Delmarva in, Del in, in uh, Delaware or BGE in uh, Baltimore, um, we should keep those in mind. Um, the, the fact that you don't always need a, um, a college degree um, to be involved in the employment opportunities with our companies, I think is really significant. Um, people should think about how they can look beyond some of their normal um, aspects of opportunity when thinking about uh, ways that they can get uh, not just into the, the workforce, but be in full-time jobs that will offer career opportunities. Um, the other thing I just wanted to, to circle back to was around bias. And we talk a lot about uh, barriers to employment and um, what are some things we can do to, to kind of move beyond those um, uh, barriers to access. It, and, and it's important to understand what the requirements are for certain jobs that you are going after so that you can either prepare yourself, uh, develop that skill set, or determine whether or not it, it is a good fit. Now, the one thing in utilities that I think we have to really keep in mind is that um, for a lot of these jobs, um, people can have height issues because ladder climbing is involved, or they can't have issues going underground because if you're looking for uh, employment in, in the gas um, aspect of what we do, um, it will require hours working um, 
underground to to put in pipe. Um, but the other thing we've got to really um, kind of get our arms around is uh, the fact that in a lot of these um, these jobs, we're we we're going to be looking at um, passing the drug test. And how do we make sure that we can kind of overcome that as a barrier um, so that we can manage making sure that that doesn't become an issue? Um, and the only other thing I do want to mention is that um, we're talking about things like that as we speak and, and as well looking at um, other, uh, other things that might help people become more um, successful in, in pursuing these types of jobs, like the soft skills. Um, the, the, the job um, interview process. Um, and I think um, some of the information that Donna and her colleagues shared is really important because people should know the resources available through CareerLink or uh, Philly Works. So even at a, at a resource like Temple University and what Shirley is doing there um, with, her, uh, with her program. So thank you, I just wanted to share that. Thanks so much, Ramona. And I, um, for those of you in the audience, you you may or may not know we have this internal chat where we're getting the you know ten minutes, five minutes. So, I um, uh, luckily have the opportunity to wrap it up, but I'm sorry to end the conversation. I really want to encourage people to do exactly as I as I mentioned earlier, is to reach out to any one of us individually or together. Um, we had a question that we don't have time to tackle here, but I thought it was a really good one um, that, from Scott that says, what, what, what do the folks on the panel feel government can do to change or to make it easier for others to make change in their respective fields? And um, I'm not the person to answer that being from government. Um, but what I will say is that uh, the city, our Commerce Department, and Philadelphia Works are are going to be later on this year putting out what we're calling a workforce recharge plan that will have very specific, concrete things that we're going to be doing together and in partnership with stakeholders to really, in the short term, help people reconnect back to work, and in the longer term, build the kinds of systems and programs that Ramona is leading at PICO to help people move along a career pathway, specifically towards sustainable jobs, the a living wage offer opportunities to advance. So if you have uh, ideas about how we can do a better job of both supporting and in, uh, sometimes and getting out of the way and other times, I encourage you please to reach out to us. We have somebody who's supporting us to um, gather all this information and we'd love to include you on our interview list. So with that, I think I'm gonna close out. Uh, and I wanna thank again, Dawn for pulling us together and to everybody behind the scenes at BPHL for making this as uh, fun and painless as, uh, as you have. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. For those who might have an interest in looking for job opportunities there, which is careers at pico.com. And again, careers at pico.com. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Ramona.